been with Fort Bend Master Gardeners uh, for the last seven years. And I have uh, helped with the programs and I'm um, helping with putting these things together and managing them. Uh, these programs are uh, possible, were made possible through the partnership uh, between Texas A&M AgriLife Extension and Fort Bend Master Gardeners. So if you have any garden related questions and if you are, in, uh, if you are a Fort Bend resident, uh, you have the option of calling our hotline or you can also send an email. And very soon, um, we will have a lot more programs in person at our demonstration gardens. So in the meantime, we are continuing these uh, Zoom classes uh, this year. And uh, today's topic is using irrigation wisely. So a lot of us uh, know the basics. If we are a gardener, we know like uh, either the plants are getting too much water or not enough water or uh, like maybe a little bit about adjusting the sprinkler heads and all, but probably not enough to use the irrigation really uh, in an efficient way. So that's what Don is going to talk about today. And let me give a little background about Don Parkhouse. He has been with the Master Gardeners for nine years. And during those nine years, he has done many, many things, uh, including he has an advanced training through Master Gardeners in rainwater harvesting, irrigation efficiency, turf care and management. So he is a non-native adoptive Texan having lived in the state for more than 70 years. So he knows it like the back of his hand. Uh, 40 of those years were spent in Fort Bend County. He and his wife, uh, Mary, both have been master gardeners and both have been office bearers and uh, they took a lot of responsibilities over the years. Uh, in the first uh, nine years of his of being a master gardener, he was heavily involved with the hotline operation. So he is very familiar with the like uh, usual questions we have about our gardening uh, problems, and uh, he knows most of the solutions. Uh, and he is very used to answering questions from the public. So today is your lucky day. If you have questions, he's a he's a man. Uh, today, Don spends most of his master gardener volunteer time utilizing his training, helping to maintain and improve uh, the demonstration gardens. And he also is heavily involved in the fundraising activities. We have uh, two main, three main fundraising activities, the fruit tree sale in the beginning of the year, uh, spring vegetable sale in the first quarter and fall vegetable sale in the last quarter of the year. So both Don and Mary are heavily involved in those. And with that introduction, I'm going to pass on the mic to Don. And uh, if your microphone and our video is not disabled, please do that because we will be recording this program and it will be more, the quality will be higher if there is uh, less uh, interruption. Thank you so much for coming today and let's sit and learn all about irrigation. I guess I have to talk if we're going to do that then. Good afternoon. I'm Don Parkhouse, as Suma said. Uh, I think the opening said I'd been nine years. I, I spent nine years just doing hotline, it seemed like, as well as attending different trainings, which it seems like all the master gardeners are encouraged to do. Uh, but uh, irrigation is, is what we're here for today, and, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on. The first slide. Uh, is kind of boilerplate. Suma touched on the relationship between AgriLife and Texas Master Gardener. Uh, the county agent that we have, the Horde agent, is part of, of AgriLife. And as Master Gardeners, we help support him. Obviously, there's one of him and there's 150, I think, of us. So we do what we can to address issues from the public, do these types of training classes, that sort of thing. So I do appreciate you attending today and let's get on with it. Uh, more of the same, uh, you can read that. I'm starting with Earthkind, and if it's a term you've not heard in the past, I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time because it is, is something that comes from AgriLife Extension. It's based on 20 years of research from Texas A&M University. 
It combines the traditional horticultural and organic gardening to create a low maintenance landscape. And more importantly, at least for me, it provides maximum protection for the environment. Uh, Earthkind has is, is got a set of goals, first one of which is to conserve water, and then has, I think it's seven principles. There we are, the principles. We're gonna be dealing with principle five, irrigation efficiency. We're not gonna go into rainwater catchment today. Uh, that's, that's another class we, we do periodically. But as you, as you look at the principles, the planning and design, uh, many of you have moved into a home that already had uh, turf in, uh, already had the landscaping done, but what can we do in those areas? Practical turf areas, that seems to be a battle between those that really like grass and those that say, well, it just uses water. Uh, appropriate plant selection, we'll touch on a little bit more today because of the impact it has and how efficient our irrigation can be. Soil improvement, we all have clay. There's not a lot we can do except amend it and add to it. Then we get down again to the, the irrigation, uh, use of mulches and some appropriate maintenance. That's both of our landscape and more importantly today will be maintenance of our irrigation system. One last item concerning Earthkind is it, it does start with you. Uh, in your own backyard, front yard, doesn't matter, but what you do does make a difference. As you can tell from the layout of this slide, it probably didn't come from this original slide set, but I, I feel it's important that we start here, uh, particularly the, the piece across the bottom, which in essence is saying, uh, we still have the same amount of water we started with here on Earth. Uh, we, we don't get any more. It's just a matter of where it happens to be. Uh, we have lakes, streams, and rivers, which are considered ground, uh, considered surface water. Groundwater, uh, think of the aquifers. I guess you hear of the Edwards Aquifer out of the Austin area all the time. And then we have the oceans. So it appears we have a lot of water so why is irrigation efficiency really important? It's becoming more important because of what's happened over the few, last few years, or I guess 50 years, subsidence has begun to take more of an effect and has become more of an issue. Uh, groundwater is where we historically have gotten our drinking water or irrigation water. But as we remove groundwater, we're beginning to see the ground that, that was supported by that water begin to collapse. And that's why the state and particularly the Gulf Coast region has begun to take measures to ban the use of groundwater for irrigation or for water consumption. There's no new wells being allowed for municipalities into groundwater sources. They're having to go to the lakes uh, and rivers, which considered surface. And one more side talking about water. Uh, it's fairly graphic. We have a whole lot of salt water. We don't have a lot of fresh water. And when you break down that fresh water, it, it winds up with a little less than 1% of our total water on the earth is from the lakes, rivers, and streams. And that's what we have to work with today for our water. And that's, that's why looking at irrigation efficiency has become more and more important. So getting on with, with irrigation efficiency and what we're going to talk about today, some of the best management practices, uh, what can we do, uh, how to audit, maintain, repair your system, get out and look at it things that as a homeowner you can do for your system, uh, how you might make changes yourself, or if you have an irrigation company that you work with, things you could ask them about. And primarily what I, I hope to achieve is that you have more confidence in your own ability 
to look at that box that's either on the side of your house or in your garage and you know, feel comfortable that you control it or have the ability to control it and what it does. I'll press the right button. We'll move right along. Fort Bend County has a water plan. The state has a water plan. There's a Brazos River Basin that has a water plan. Seems like everybody's looking at a water plan these days. Uh, 2011 was a horrific uh, drought for this area. I don't know how many of, of you are new to the county. Uh, much worse than what we're seeing right now, even though we're, we're beginning to see the effects of the drought. Hopefully next week, we're gonna get some rain and things will look up for us. But the restrictions on landscape irrigation that occur during the droughts are, are just exacerbated. And it has led the state in their water plan to put out a message. Uh, the gist of it is Texas does not have enough water to meet the needs of people, its businesses, and its agricultural enterprises. And that's why they've made the, uh, the steps or taken the steps they have to try to improve how we use water. So the takeaway here is the last bullet there on the slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. If demand for limited natural resource can be reduced, everyone benefits. There's more to go around. Hopefully we don't continue to pay more and more for it. Uh, The title here is Conservation and Irrigation Efficiency. And it's, it's phrased that way because conservation comes first. How, how can we use less? And then with what we are using, how can we be more efficient? And that's some of what we'll be looking at today. Uh, I'll let you give you a second to look down through those. I think the most important item is, is landscapes don't waste water, people do. Uh, it's it's very true that uh, pardon me found another quote that goes along with that that uh, that lawn did not reach over and turn on the water faucet the owner did uh, can't blame it on the faucet one of the things we have incorporated in today's presentation are a couple of questions. I want to get you, my audience, involved. And it's time for the first question. Uh, I do encourage you to, it, it's, it's a simple yes, no type vote. And the, uh, the question is, do you have an irrigation system? And your choices are going to be yes and no. Give you a few minutes to cast your votes. Don, can you see the poll? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. I'm I'm seeing the results. Uh, it looks like voting has stopped. We only have 36 people that have voted, so we have a few who didn't vote. But don't want to take too long. Getting a few more in. Anybody else want to vote? I'm ending the poll, and now everyone should be able to see the results. Most of you have an irrigation system, and that's good. Some of you who voted no, when I put up my next slide and explain it, may have to change your answer. I freely admit this was an, an A&M prepared slide that says 89% of single families. And, and that's not too far off from what we had. But in the footnotes that came to me with this slide, they say watering with a hose, a nozzle, a sprinkler, et cetera, is the simplest form of irrigation. So I think most all of us have some form of an irrigation system, but we don't have an automated irrigation system. 
one that turns itself on, turns itself off, decides how long it'll run in between. And of those that have an irrigation system, the numbers that, that again, A&M has, has compiled uh, is that 85% don't understand how their irrigation system works. And that's part of, of us being able to be more efficient is gaining that understanding. And as a, a homeowner with an irrigation system, uh, the questions that come up are, how long should I run this? Uh, should I run it every day, every other day, once a week? Uh, what are my, my plant water requirements? And, and we talk about turf pretty commonly, but looking at the rest of your ornamentals, are they on the same sort of cycle? Uh, flowers, bushes, trees, et cetera. The other big thing to consider, and so many of the older irrigation systems don't account for, is precipitation. When it does rain, we don't need to irrigate. Uh, we'll talk some on how to set your irrigation controller and how to maintain the system. Uh, I think most homeowners that have a system and that, that potentially overwater, it's not because they, they're interested in wasting the water, it's they simply don't know how to control it. So the end of, of my talk, I'm hoping we have changed that. So some of the best management practices, uh, this water only when required. Uh, you don't wanna water with anything that's going to drip on a plant, whether it's, it's your vegetable garden, your flowers, anything else at night, not with a conventional spray type system. That's why we say best after 6 p.m. or before 10 a.m. You're trying to do it when the sun's not at its brightest or hottest, but yet you wanna give all of your plants an opportunity to have the time to dry out. Having water sit on most foliage overnight is detrimental for the plant. Uh, the idea of, of looking at your uh, water requirement in the morning. I know my wife and I will walk out here in the late afternoon and it seems like every plant in the garden is drooping a bit. So let them have the night, the little bit of, if you wanna call it cool of the day, and hopefully they're gonna look a little better in the morning. The other thing has to do with your lawn. Uh, if you walk on your lawn first thing in the morning and it crunches under your shoe or your barefoot's even better, but if it crunches, it probably needs water. Uh, this one inch of water will generally penetrate the soil to a depth of six inches. And the parentheses there is soak and cycle. That's a start stop method of, of irrigation. And we're going to talk more about that. Uh, I mentioned earlier that most all of us have clay as a base. There's a very small section of Fort Bend County that, that has some sand to it, but by and large, we're all sitting on a, a heavy clay base and it doesn't absorb water well. Uh, it takes a long time for water to penetrate clay. Uh, the last two bullets, the never water on a windy day, well, it, be out of luck the last couple of weeks with the winds we've been having because there haven't been any non-windy days. But I'll have some pictures that show some of the uh, effects of wind on irrigation. Anything that's using a fine droplet tends to get blown away and you wind up losing water, either it's on your sidewalk or in the street, that sort of thing, or it evaporates before it ever gets to the ground. And the last one begins to, to get into some of the things you as a homeowner are going to want to do. And that's at least look at your system. Uh, you know, it, you can see if you have a brown lawn or your plants are, are withering or don't look healthy. Uh, sometimes everything looks good, but if you'll walk around, you may find a wet spot or something that just seems a little out of place. And catching it early uh, makes it easier to fix and it saves you money.
going to talk about a, a specific case. This was one of our master gardeners that uh, said, wait a minute, I'm spending way too much on my water bill. And we asked her to, to, to bring us if she had them. And fortunately, she did. She had uh, actually a couple of years worth of water bills, but brought in two Decembers a year apart. And you can look at those numbers and see the usage was cut almost in a fifth, I guess, is what I would look at from 34 down to seven units. The other thing that I would particularly have you look at is there's basic services, that's a fee. Then you have residential water as the third item. Then we have sewer. And then the, the one that's somewhat redacted or a little more difficult is, is North Fort Bend Water Association. And those were fees they were putting on it. But you're paying for a lot more than water coming into your home when you pay your water bill. So I encourage you to take a look at it and see what you're paying for. In the case of this particular individual, we did some things as far as her irrigation system. And that's the only thing we affected. We as master gardeners look at water on the outside of the home. We don't look at, at water conservation, washing machine, dishwasher, you know, watering habits inside. Uh, so this was strictly irrigation that we were dealing with, trying to reduce the usage. And it came down significantly. We found that there's some things broken that were causing tremendous amount of loss and then found some more efficient ways for her to water. But in the, the savings that were achieved, huge amount of water and 300,000 gallons is more than a lot of people actually consume in a year. So to be able to save that, uh, she thought was, was great. And more importantly, the money that she saved. You know, this is a, an average of, of what her monthly savings were projected and the, the savings that were, I hope, truly realized on this. But again, we were just simply looking at the water bills. We did make the changes and definitely saw a change in what she was having to pay each month. We got any questions so far? Suma, is there, there anything that needs to be addressed? No. Yeah. Uh... Hello? Yes. Um, I wanted to know how you can determine one inch of water when you're watering with a hose. Will, if you'll give me a minute, I'll cover that. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? That's all. All right. Gonna... So there is uh, a something from Mimi, but I'm not sure if there is a question in this. I think she says after I installed my sprinkler system back in summer of 2018, I had three months of water bills ranging from 210, 200, 190. I stopped using the system. Normal bills are under 55. So is she using hand? Uh, is she hand watering without using the sprinkler system? I'm not sure if there's a question there. Yeah, I don't have a sprinkler system. I use my hose to water my plants and lawn. Mm -hmm. So you're not watering now and that's how you've, you've achieved that, that reduction? Um, I don't have a sprinkler system. I have to use my hose to water my plants, vegetables, fruits, and uh, all the landscape. So right now, like, do you know what your water bill is? Uh, maybe around 200. Okay, so even if you didn't have the sprinkler system, your water bill is still 200. Yes. Yeah. Okay, you, you, you said that your normal bills are under 55, and I'm, I'm, if, if it's 200, what, what is the normal coming from? John, can I jump in? These yes, are, please do. These are two different people who were talking. The one who put in the message was Mimi. 
Juan, and the person who's answering you is someone else. I'm sorry, did not realize that. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure I have a, a, a response at this time to, to what's posted then. Let's yeah, see let's to the end. Okay, I'm gonna move along. I'm, at the end, we'll come back to that if we've not covered it to, uh, to answer the, the specific there. Sure. So let's, let's talk about irrigation system. Just pictures of some of the basic components. Uh, the, uh, the box in the center bottom is your irrigation controller. The uh, picture slightly above it, the actual photograph is going to be your backflow preventer. Uh, the lower left-hand corner is a, a valve. That's what actually turns or allows the water to flow out to the sprinkler devices. Directly above it are actually two different types of rotors. To the right of those, there's five different what are ca called pop-up spray heads. Uh, these are the things that are, are down in the ground. They extend upward. The water pushes the shaft up and then it sprays water when it when water is applied. Beyond that, we simply have some, some PVC fittings. And in the uh, lower right-hand corner is a coil of drip tubing. That's roughly half inch size tubing and it has emitters embedded in it to allow water to flow out. So that's, that's the basic pieces that go into any irrigation system. And now I'm gonna get into a little more detail. The drawing you're seeing or diagram was prepared by, by Hunter Sprinkler. You've got Hunter, Rainbird, Toro, Orbit, or for the bigger ones, I'm sure there are others. But uh, just by way of information, some of their parts are interchangeable, some are not. So you have to, to kind of check based on what you have. You may have a Rainbird controller and Hunter actually sprinkler heads. So knowing what you have is going to become at least part of the, the learning process. I wanna go through this diagram. I, I do feel it's important in the uh, lower portion of the screen. In fact, it just barely shows possibly on yours is going to, it says valve box, uh, it says a brass gate valve. Hopefully everyone's finding that. Uh, I'm, they have included the fact that it's a, a brass valve. Uh, any of your brass or metallic valves are generally rebuildable. You normally will not find a PVC valve installed there because it is not rebuildable. If it fails, it has to be completely cut out of the line and reconnected. And that's the reason they, they use a metal one at that point. The next piece going forward would be a, a backflow preventer uh, shown center screen at the bottom. And uh, let me see if I can do a better job. I, I don't know if y'all can, can see me on your screen or my little insert. If you have me up, I'm holding up a backflow preventer. It is uh, the heaviest, biggest piece of equipment in your, your irrigation system. What it does is let the water only flow one way. Once it enters your, your piping, your piping has the ability to actually suck back in occasionally, particularly if there's a failure somewhere prior to your property. And the, the reason to have a backflow preventer is if there is fertilizer or herbicide in your lawn to make sure it is not pulled back into the municipal water system and contaminate anything. That's why any irrigation system is required to have a backflow preventer. From the backflow preventer forward into your property, you as a homeowner can 
work on it yourself. Backflow preventer going toward the, the meter, you'd have to have a professional or a licensed individual to, uh, to make any repairs. The, uh, here's just a, a, a bit of a blow up of the, uh, the valve and the backflow preventer. Uh, there is a notation there on the, the preventer as far as height. And that has to do with the way water would normally flow or be siphoned. And this, this stops the fight, siphon effect of the water also. Again, like it, it's, it's to no water from your system can go back past this device. Generally, well, there's no generally, it, it has to be above ground because it's gotta be serviced periodically. You'll either find it uh, hidden by shrubs sometimes out in the front part of the yard. A lot of times it's installed near the house. Uh, so it's protected as much as possible. Uh, this is one of the most susceptible pieces to freezing if you do not shut off the water for your irrigation system. And because it's metallic, it's, it's a brass casting, it tends to break very quickly if it freezes. So protecting it uh, has to be one of the, the important jobs if you have one or a list of things to do when it's going to freeze. Make sure your, your backflow preventer is protected. We're going to move from the backflow preventer. Back out to our diagram. Moving out to a, there's a, a box that's, I'm going to just enlarge it, bring it up. This is a valve box. Uh, in the particular diagram we have, we only have two valves installed, two major runs. Uh, so th those are generally considered zone. Uh, uh, the normal residential controller would have six to maybe eight zones, and that's different sections of irrigation that go off at any one time. Taking a, a better look at that valve box, there are wires that come from the controller to that, and that's what turns on those valves. There's some little, I don't know how else to describe it, but white thimble looking pieces. And those, those are what take the wires from the valves and connect them to the control wires. The only thing unique about those is they do have a, a gel in them. And the intent there is a valve box tends to be a wet environment. It keeps the wires and the connections dry. So you, you don't have a short. Sometimes having a valve that doesn't work is as simple as the wires got separated somehow. So it's the only reason I, I bring that up is, is if you have to take up a part, either try to reuse the, the same piece to put the wires back together or get something that's made specifically for irrigation wiring. Okay, gonna go back to my drawing. We're gonna move further out along the, the if you will, right-hand side from that valve box. And these are spray heads. Uh, let's see if I can. Again, I'm going to hold this up. I don't, I don't know for sure how well, or if at all, you can see it. Uh, spray head is is generally considered a, a pop up device. Uh, on the particular one that I've got to blow up or on the screen there, there's three on, on that particular run. 
there's two more above it. And I think there's actually six that show in the total diagram. The way this is plumbed, all six of those would be going off at the same time. So you're putting out a lot of water during that particular run cycle. Uh, the smaller shaft on the top of the spray is what comes up out of the ground. These are also mounted there. They look to be not mounted directly into the primary piece of PVC. They're on a small swing arm. It's, it's a great installation method because if you have to readjust or reposition where that, that device is, you have a little bit of literally wiggle room if it's done that way. There's nothing in the code that says the guy has to do that. I just mention it because this one happens to depict it. There's also a circled item on this particular slide, and that's going to be your rain freeze sensor. This particular one uses solar power, so you don't have to get up and change the battery in it periodically, and it's wireless, so you don't you can go further away from your controller and not have to wire, run a, an additional wire. It communicates with your controller. If it has rained recently, this will cause your system. It goes through the cycle, but when it tries to send the current out to the valve box, it can't do it. And it just keeps your sprinkler system from going off if this thing has sensed that there is enough moisture that you don't need irrigation at that time. This is on the left-hand side of the, the two pieces of pipe that uh, we're gonna go and talk about a rotor. Very similar to a spray head, it comes up as well. The only difference is it puts out a lot more water, usually used to cover a larger section of lawn. Uh, and that's, this goes up to 14 to 16 gallons a minute that can be put out from this device. So you don't see them a whole lot in residential unless you have a, a particularly large lawn. All right, I kind of covered the, the pieces. As you look at this drawing, I, I do want you to consider the fact that the, the box that houses the valves, that green cover, that's at grass level or ground level. Everything else is underground. You're looking at, at something, most of this drawing would be underground by about a foot to 16 inches. So you, you're not gonna see any of it except when it's turned on and functioning by and large, other than finding these, these green, either rectangle or round tops. Those you generally are going to be on top of your automated valves or any valves that you manually turn on or off. Gonna move to the controller. There's a brown section to this drawing, kind of the, uh, the left-hand edge. From the way this is drawn, I'm gonna make the assumption this was installed in the garage. That's not uncommon for the controller to be there. Uh, controllers can be either rain tight or, or weatherable, or they have to be protected. Uh, protected just because it, it doesn't have the insulation around it to uh, keep all of the guts dry. On this particular controller, on the right-hand edge of it, we have what's called a, a smart controller wireless. And again, it's, it's going to be a receiving unit out to that rain freeze sensor. Below that is a remote control receiver. And that's something that, that is both of these somewhat new, uh, probably the last 10, maybe 15 years, but they're, they're coming into vogue more and more. And it's like everything else, there's an app for that. Now you can do a lot of communication with your controller from your smartphone even. 
So that's why having some of these things is, is really nice. So Don, I have a couple of questions. Do you want to answer them now or yeah. later? Okay. Right now is fine. Okay, I, I have a feeling you may cover this later, but I'm going to run it by you anyway. So the first one is from Michael Hand, and he says he's using about 850 gallons every time he runs his irrigation system. He has eight zones. They run about seven to 10 minutes per zone. And he thinks this is a lot of water for a quarter of an acre. Um, so he's asking you, do you think this is right? Or is it possible that he has a leak somewhere? But he also says he periodically audited, audits his irrigation system and he has not seen any overflow or you know leak. I'm gonna to ask to come back to that I, I want to talk about something. We're going to talk about uh, measuring the output. Okay. Uh, if I don't, if I don't answer your question, then please remind me, and we'll readdress it. Okay. I think this one probably is more uh, you can answer now. Can you control multiple zones with one control valve? Valve. Uh, control valve or controller. So I think he meant uh, this from Prem. Can you control multiple zones with one valve? No. Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. Uh, the the diagram that I have up on the screen, we have a a a box that has two valves in it, and each valve in there controls a zone. Now, both of those valves are controlled by the one single controller. I don't know if that, did that answer your question? Yes. Super, okay. Uh, was there anything else, Suma? That's it for now. Okay. John, this is Nancy. I had one question sent to me. Should the soaker hose be placed closer to the foundation or one foot from the foundation in the flower beds? Are you're talking soaker hose, not drip? Correct. Okay. Is the intent to try to keep their foundation wet or are they trying to irrigate plants? I don't know that the question is. Uh, yeah, I, and, and the, the, there is a distinction. Uh, a, a lot of people try to, to keep their foundations wet during extremely dry weather, or at least moistened. Uh, if you are irrigating plants being right up against the foundation, you're not gonna get the spread because water will try to spread two directions, either side of your hose. So if you're, if you're using it for irrigation of plant material, uh, putting it to where the water can flow either direction from it is better. So being a foot away would be the better positioning. Okay, thank All you. All right. Last item from that drawing I wanna mention is uh, the remote control, no different than one you have from your TV, whether it's a, a device like this, or if your controller uh, has either Bluetooth or Wi-Fi capability, you could dial into it potentially from your phone. But when uh, you start trying to check out your irrigation system, if your controller's housed in the garage, one of the things you need to do is turn on each zone and go look at it. It's a whole lot easier if you can stand out in your yard and remotely turn on zone one, zone two, zone three, et cetera, as you go through. It, it, it's no different than the TV, whether you wanna get up and press the buttons on it or press the one you know, while you sit in your lazy boy. Uh, so that's, it, it's another of the niceties that has come out in the last few years. I'm gonna move along here. We, we covered what was in the ground. 
want to talk a little bit more on efficiencies of those. Uh, the last item on there is spray heads, and you see it is the least efficient as far as, as the amount of water you use. I mean, you, you use twice as much water as you actually benefit from. And the picture on that slide is a spray head. Uh, it's high pressure coming up, hitting a, a plastic or metal disc that causes it to just turn into a, a multi-droplet, very fine spray. It evaporates in the air and it's very easily blown off target or completely just blown off with some of the winds we've been having recently. Going back to the top of the slide, is surface and su subsurface drip. Surface is the drip tubing that I had talked about or showed a little bit. Subsurface is buried uh, in the ground. We're beginning to see a little more subsurface drip in lawns. They've done a lot of testing and there, there's actually drip that can be installed in the lawn. Not seeing this being done much as a retrofit but in new installations, it's something if you were having a new home built, you could at least inquire about is having drip for your lawn. You'd have no spray heads. Uh, life expectancy is anywhere from 15 to 20 years. So it's, it's, it's a pretty good investment. It is by far the most efficient means of irrigation. Then you get into surface micro drip, which uses uh, drip tubing with individual emitters that are anywhere from a quarter to half or even as high as, as maybe a gallon a minute. And that's the thing about drip. You talk about gallons per minute, or when we get down to the multi-stream, the rotors and the spray heads, you're talking gallons, excuse me, gallons an hour on, on drip. The others are gallons per minute. You, you could have a two gallon per minute per hour dripper versus a two gallon per minute spray head. Uh, substantially more water being put out uh, with any kind of a spray mechanism. So the, the takeaway here is, is drip gonna fit in your situation? For your flower beds, absolutely. For your lawn, probably not. So the, the concentration or the efficiency we may achieve is to look at your landscape beds for, for drip. And I think that's where the next slide, yes, gonna take us. This is, is landscaping and that's drip tubing that you're seeing laid out there. This is kind of the raw form, uh, that's, that's bare soil. You'd come back in once this is laid in and cover it with mulch and you don't even see the tubing at that point, but you're looking at a 90% a efficient irrigation system. It does a, a spectacular job. Tubing of this type is about half inch diameter. Fittings are, are a, a plastic push on type thing. Uh, and then the emitters can be either one foot apart, 18 inches or as much as two foot apart. In general landscape, we have found that, that the one foot apart probably works a little better because invariably people put in plants and they decide, oh, I really want one more. Well, you don't have to add irrigation, it's already there. Uh, and as you can see, this is, is kind of a, a non hard line. It's put in as, as well, it, it has a nice curve to it but then you have to have these laterals in between because the drip is only going to spread so far. Uh, where with a, uh, a rotor or a, a pop-up spray head, you, you might run it for three minutes or five minutes or eh, maybe even eight. With drip irrigation, you're going to have this thing run uh, for 20 minutes to as, as much as sometimes 40 minutes in order to get enough water distributed. 
the advantage is a very slow release is going to let the water penetrate the soil and spread. And that's part of how you get that uh, six inch depth with one inch of water. Moving right along. Uh, I should have put this one up and I wouldn't have confused you. If I did, I apologize. I, I, I do wanna make sure that, that y'all are aware of this. We're looking at gallons per hour versus gallons per minute. And it's huge. If you compare a two gallon an hour to two gallons a minute, well, if you happen to run that, that bubbler for an hour, you, you've put out uh, 120 gallons compared to the two gallons from the drip emitter. And like I say, all of your, uh, the pop-up, the rotor we talked about, a, a, a bubbler, the best way I could describe it is, is a, a leaky pipe. Uh, if, if you screwed a piece of pipe together and, and it leaks water, that's very similar to what a bubbler is, except it's supposed to leak. Now we're getting into some of the things that, that can, can really help make your system more efficient. And we covered the basic components, talked about the controller, the valves, and, and the, the units that, that spray. Uh, being willing to look at that, that controller and take control of it, if you will, is what I feel a lot of homeowners don't do. When the systems are put in, the people who install them are doing it in new construction with new lawn, and it's not uncommon for them to be set to go off every day or every other day and run longer than they really need to. Uh, there, there's three, three settings that I come to mind for me on your controller that are really important. Manual, that means you're, you're turning on one zone right now to see how it works. Auto, which turns your system to where, however it's set, it goes ahead and, and then runs, does that. And one of the most important settings on your controller is off. At the, the gardens, our demonstration gardens, we tend to, to turn the irrigation off November 1st, and we don't turn it back on until March the 1st. So we, we just don't let it run. Uh, sometimes some of the garden chairs come and complain to those of us that do irrigation. And we strongly suggest if they've got new plants or they have a plant that they're having problems with, get a hose. But you don't need to be running your, your irrigation system. So, and then the, the other thing as you move forward, uh, not necessarily from, from the controller but you'd need to set your controller in manual and turn on a zone. Like I said, you probably have six to eight. I think one gentleman said he had more than that. And that, I mean, some of the controllers will go to 22 zones. That, that's not common for typical residential. So thinking in terms of six or eight, but you'd go through, turn it to manual, turn on that zone and go look for are my sprinklers spraying? Do I have broken pipes, broken heads, misaligned heads, clogged? Uh, it has something grown up in front of one of them so they're not doing what they should. And that's what you're looking for. That's kind of the first pass because any of those are going to cause you to waste water. This is going back to the uh, backflow preventer. This one is obviously up against the house. The right-hand picture, you can kind of see where the green is and that's a crack. This one froze. Uh, if, you, if, if this froze and then, then thaw it out, you're gonna have water just spraying out. Uh, so it, it, it would be very obvious. Uh, you don't have to have your system turned on to see that one. These, the, the one on the left is probably a rotor. 
And excuse me, Don. Yes. Uh, can I uh, on the back flow back flow preventer protector? Um, the question is, how do we protect it from cracking during winter? Good question. Uh, two things. There's in the diagram that that I had up. There was a valve that went to the. It, there was a valve and then a backflow preventer. Turn that valve off, and that basically shuts off the water that that goes to the irrigation system. And then open one of the valves on the backflow preventer. There's some small valves that can be opened and that'll drain all of the water from that. If there's no water in the piping, there's nothing to freeze. The other thing is the backflow preventer, when it was installed, should have been insulated and maintaining the insulation around it. Or if possible, if you have something you can cover it up with. Uh, depending upon the size and the piping that came up above ground, whether that can be done with a, a bucket or like half a whiskey barrel makes a pretty good cover for a, a, a backflow preventer. Sometimes a valve box set on the surface just on top of the uh, uh, backflow preventer is also helpful. But the most important thing is to shut the water off and drain it. If you can drain the water, there's nothing left to freeze. Other question? Yes. Um, Elizabeth says her rain sensor is not working. Can be battery unless it's solar powered. That's the most common one. Uh, it could be dirty if it's been there a long time. Uh, birds, unfortunately, like to, to sit on them, perch on them, and sometimes they'll clog them up to where they won't work. Uh, a rain sensor works. It's It's got, usually it's three or four, what look like almost wooden or ceramic discs. And as they, when they get wet, they expand. And they, they if, if it's hardwired, they break a circuit. If it's just sending a signal, it, it tells the controller, I've shut off, but uh, if those are clogged or can't move like they're supposed to, uh, or the batteries did, those are the most common things. Next. Let, let me go to chat and just look at, at the question, Suma. I'll do that. No, that's okay. That's fine. Okay. Uh, I think that is it for now. Okay. Yeah. I did suggest that, uh, um, how do we know, uh, like uh, to look for all these things in Sugarland, the city of Sugarland offers a free audit. Great. Yeah, so I did it a couple of times. I do it once in a while and uh, they come and check everything and they give you a report on uh, the broken sprinkler heads and uh, where, if there is any problem and all those things. So we can make uh, use of that free service. I don't know about the other cities though. You may have to go on the city's website and check. They would have to check with whoever is supplying their water. Uh, it's a lot of times on the water bill, there'll be a number for questions or some of them will list uh, if they're doing it, they'll call it a smart sense audit or just a water audit, irrigation audit. Uh, and if, if they'll come out and the people they have are usually city employees, but they are trained irrigators and they'll come out and like you say, give you a written report that it, they'll do this for you. And that, that's great. I, I do strongly encourage people to either go with them so you see yourself what they're seeing at least once uh, or trying to familiar familiarize yourself with your system so you could do it if you had to. But by all means, take advantage of all the free services you can. So Prem asked, he needs more uh, clarification on the backflow, uh, backflow protection, but Nancy has posted a winterizing uh, article. So I think that may help him. Okay. 
Uh, and you can come back to it if you want uh, later. We, you we can. Uh, I'm not familiar with the article Nancy has sent, so I, I'm, I'm not sure. The, the best thing is if you can shut the water off and drain it, uh, there won't be water to freeze. And, and that's the, the biggest single takeaway, but protecting it like you would anything else from freezing as if it were uh, a water pipe uh, is really good practice. Okay, I, I talked about uh, the on, on what's on the screen here, we've, we've got what appears to be a rotor that's probably just simply come unscrewed and water came on and it, it, it's a matter of putting it back together. The one on the right hand side, uh, can't imagine what bent that. Uh, maybe a limb fell off a tree and it would have had to have done it while the irrigation system was going off. But if you're looking at something like that, rather than thinking in terms of having to dig that out of the system, if you unscrew the top on these things, the whole guts of it come out and you can leave the casing in place and just replace that bent piece, screw it back together. It's a, a fairly simple thing to do yourself once you've identified the pieces you need to do it. So again, don't, don't be afraid to, to take a hard look at some of these. They're, they're not really complicated. Yeah, this one is uh, what we typically refer to as the geyser, whether somebody ran over it with a lawnmower or it froze and then thawed and got turned on. Uh, for whatever reason, the top of the, uh, the pop-up or rotor is just gone. So it's shooting up. And that's anywhere from, from three to 20 gallons a minute while it runs that it could put out. So it, it's one that's very easy to spot and obviously one very important to, to get fixed. Uh, if you find any of these, the first thing to do is shut your system off, uh, flag wherever it is so you can find it again, but turning it off so it, because as an automated system, it will continue. It doesn't recognize that there's a break. One more instance, uh, this doesn't happen in our environment very often. This is high pressure and it'll be literally a cloud that appears from a, a pop-up. And uh, I, I have encountered some where people have had some, some breakage because their, their water pressure hit 80 PSI. Most of your irrigation equipment will withstand that kind of pressure that's higher than what you're usually after. Uh, most of them are designed to work between 30 and 40 PSI. So if you have exceptionally high pressure where you are, uh, you're more, you would be more likely to, to see this though it, it's gotta be close to the 80 and up type range before you'd, you'd find that. The disadvantage or obvious disadvantage here is, is you get no irrigation. Uh, this fully evaporates before any of it touches the ground. Here's one that's fairly easy to fix. You, you know there's something under there trying to spray because it's it kind of looks like a spray head. Uh, take a pair of clippers, clip around that, or even your weed eater uh, if, if you're, you can. Just clean out the top and see if you can see what's going on, it may be that, that there's just grass has grown over it. It doesn't take much if it's a pop-up to uh, come across the top, cause it to not be able to pop up. And once it happens two or three times, it just gets worse. So cleaning it uh, is, is a pretty quick fix on this one. You're not gonna cut down the tree. Uh, you're not gonna move the tree. So moving the sprinkler heads is, is your best bet on something like this. Uh, again, going back to the, the diagram we had earlier, and I commented that, that everything they had was mounted on a swing arm. If these were in fact done that way, you might be able to, to reposition the head enough to one side or the other 
using the swing arm. The other thing about most of these uh, spray heads is they use half inch PVC and they can be relocated. Uh, you'd, you'd need to move it to one side and generally something like this cannot be fixed with a single head. It's gonna take at least two being repositioned to get you the coverage that the tree is now interfering with. Uh, this one may not be a, a, a homeowner fix, but it, it's not a, a major undertaking, something that cannot be done. There was a question earlier on, I guess, how much, we, well, this may not address yours. This is turf specifically. Uh, in our area, we've, we've got Bermuda. There's a, a few people who have zoysia and a lot have St. Augustine. Uh, knowing what type of grass you have is, is really important. Suma, uh, I'm getting an indication that there was a problem. There was uh, a you, problem. I can see your slide. I can see you. Okay, good enough. I, I just wanted to make sure I, something had popped up on my screen and I wanted to make sure I hadn't lost people. Are you able to move the uh, slides? Yes. Okay. I, I see everything. Okay. And uh, uh, somebody is asking where is the rain sensor? to check it for dirt or battery? Well, that one, I hate doing this to you, but. <laughs> I know. <gasps> yeah. In, in the diagram we had, it's mounted here. Uh, frequently it'll be mounted on a, uh, the edge of a gutter coming off a garage. Uh, it, it has to be outside, obviously, because it, it has to be rained upon to work. Uh, but this one is mounted on an external pole because it's wireless. I think at the gardens, the one we, we have two there for different systems, one's mounted on a, uh, on a gutter on the side of a building, and the other one is much like this. It's a wireless mounted on an external pole. Uh, it it has to be within range if it's wireless, and if it if it's you you want to make sure it's in a position where it's not shaded by a tree or if wind's being blown that it's not being blocked by a tree or shrubs or you know, another building. You want to get it high enough that uh, when it rains, this knows that it has rained. Okay. I apologize as I zoom back through these. So um, one more question. Sure. How to locate a valve head? A That's valve. the green thing, right? I'm sorry, I'm not in understanding the question. How to locate a val valve head location? Uh, Glenn, I think they're asking how to locate a zone control valve because they can be tricky to find. They can. Uh, as far as locating them, uh, if you can turn on the zone, that will at least give you an area. Uh, let, let's say you're, you're looking for zone three. You've gone to manual run on your controller, set it for manual, zone three, turned it on, walk out, and it's the backyard right hand against the fence that you see water being sprayed. There is a good possibility that that valve box is going to be number one in the backyard and probably if you only have two zones, it may be centrally located, but closer to your home than further away. Uh, most of the time, unless grass has grown over it, I know Nancy had some problems locating some recently, uh, there will be a, a valve box and you'll see this, this greenish looking cover on top of it. Uh, beyond that, uh, get a hold of an irrigator, 
not not a plumber, but a true irrigator. They do have instrumentation available so they can trace lines, uh, both electrical or, or plumbing line. Uh, and that's the about all you can do unless you want to try to get out there with a probe and and probe to locate it. But depending upon how big your yard is, that that can be a daunting task. Don't know if I got your question. So. I'm going to go back to. Uh, Don, can you uh, stop for a second? Sure. At, uh, at the slide which shows uh, the duration of watering based how, on the. How much is enough? Or... Yeah, how much is it? Not yeah, this, that... but the next, the next, uh, the one where you showed uh, sprinkler, like uh, sprinkler head versus bubblers versus. Uh, this this one? one, yeah. Okay. Somebody wants to take a picture. Oh, super. Okay. Is there a question they have? No, no. They just wanted. Okay. To see that slide again. All right. Glad to accommodate. Takeaway here is you need to know what kind of grass you have. Uh, more and more of our, our new developments in the Fort Bend County area have gone to Bermuda uh, simply because it has a lower water requirement than, than St. Augustine. Uh, a lot of people don't care for it, uh, but if it's what your HOA says you have to have, that's what you've got. So don't, there's no reason to overwater it. It won't do any good uh, giving it more water than it needs. What I want to get to is really the next slide. The uh, lower left-hand picture there is, uh, those are, are the, they're called catch cans. And someone had asked, how do you determine how much water or how long it takes? And this is where you'd, you'd use a catch can. Those are, are almost like a, a, snow can, a snow cone cup, if you will. Uh, they come with gradients already marked. You put them out in your, your grass or your turf area or, or in your, your beds for that matter, if you're trying to, to estimate there though, hopefully your beds we're gonna get to drip with, but any place you've got spray particularly, uh, you'd put these out and then run, run that zone for 15 minutes or 10 minutes. If, it, if it's putting out a lot of water, you know, you don't want to run it to the point of runoff, but run it long enough to where you collect some water in your catch can. And the, the, the fancy ones have gradients already molded into them. And then you can just read it on the side. If you don't want to spend the the, the money for those, the, uh, the right-hand picture is a cat food can or tuna can, and it works just as well. The only other piece of equipment required is probably a plastic ruler, because when you get through, you've got to measure how much water is in there. If, if you ran your system for 15 minutes and you have a quarter of an inch of, of water in that can, that means you're putting out one inch an hour. Hopefully that, that math works for you. Uh, the question is how far or how close should the catch can be to the sprinkler head? You don't want to be at the sprinkler head. You want to be where the water is coming down. That's why looking at that, that picture, you, you can kind of see where the, the, the sprinkler heads are and the catch cans are maybe halfway or, or at least several feet away. They're done in, they put out several there and what you'd have to do is, is aggregate, uh, let's say there's six catch cans being used, record the values and then take an average. And that's gonna give you the best determination. 
but you, you want it at the point where the water is coming down. If you're too close, uh, you're going to get some water, uh, but you got, the, it, it appears to be crossing patterns there. So they're doing head-to-head uh, -head spray. So you get full coverage, but being a little distance away from it is, is better than being on top of it. Other questions on that? Um, so I think you might have covered this in the repairs or, uh, so sprinkler is too tall to spray lower plants. How do I put in shorter one? Uh, I'm, I'm listening, I'm trying to do something here. I apologize for being off camera and I don't know if y'all can see that at all. Can you? Yes, we can see it. That, that's a, a, a pop-up sprinkler. That's a pop-up sprinkler. I don't know if you can see them side by side there. We can um, see. John, scoot back a little further from the screen. Okay. Yeah, my, perfect. My, my, my other screen went dead on me. That's why I, I don't know what you're seeing. But those do the exact same thing. Uh, one of them has the ability to, to go up about eight inches. The other one only goes up four inches. But if you're doing trying to get under something, you could put in a, a smaller spray head or the, and I apologize, I just took that spray head apart. The piece right on the end can be changed out. It unscrews. It can control how much water and how far it sprays. So there's, with each one, there's a couple of different variables that, that can be modified. Uh, if you're, you're just simply too tall, it, have the plants grown to the point that they're bushier and you, you can't get under them anymore? Is that that's what you're trying to solve? Uh, Suma, Nancy, can either of y'all let me know? John, there's no other information. I think just keep going and at the okay. end, people can unmute themselves and ask specific questions like that. Okay, super. I said we'd come back to soak and cycle, and I, I, I do want to spend a little more time explaining that. I, I commented that, that almost all of us are on, on clay. Uh, the other place soak and cycle is really important is if you have a slope. Uh, my wife has a, a, a bed along a fence line and it slopes, uh, so we, uh, we had to go to that. If, if you run it very long, the water will penetrate a little bit. And then there's, there's kind of a surface tension to dirt, much like surface tension to water. Uh, and it, it just won't sink in. Uh, it, it goes so far and then it just starts to run. But by wetting the soil just a little bit and then turning off your irrigation system, run it as the slide says, run it for, for 10 minutes or less, uh, run it just enough to, to get things damp, shut it off. And that begins to break up the pores of the soil, if you will. Uh, run it again, and you can run it a little longer the next time. Turn it off, do it a third time. If you, number one, if your controller will let you, and if you have the time to do it. Uh, if you have multiple zones, you get into an issue because you, you have so much runtime that you have to if you're running all your zones. But if you can do it a third time with soak and cycle, it works even better. A lot of the newer controllers actually have something that's called soak cycle, where you put in how many cycles and how long you want it to run, and you're done with it. And an older controller, maybe you have an A, B, C setting. And what you do is you'd program A, B, and C to to run simultaneously, running the same zone for a short period of time. 
Uh, so there, there is a way to do it even with the older controllers. Let's talk about some of the newer technologies. Uh, I blew it. I should have asked. We got another question, people. Yeah, we have one more question. Michael um, is asking that I think I ran it by you before, but since you're talking about the quantity of water, mm -hmm. I think this is a good time to talk about this. I'm, sure. Okay. So he's using it at 850 gallons every time he runs his irrigation. He has eight zones, a uh, quarter of an acre, and he runs seven to 10 minutes each zone. Uh, so he's asking, is there a leak? Is this like, does it sound reasonable to you to have 850 gallons? The, 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 the catch can test would be the first thing I'd want to see you do. Uh, see how much water you're putting out. It sounds like an awful lot of water. Uh, what kind of grass do you have? Uh, if it's St. Augustine versus Bermuda, uh, if it were Bermuda, you'd probably be having some, some actual browning or yellowing of the grass because it would be excessive. But using a catch can test would be a, a good first step to determine how much water you're actually putting out. That's the first thing I'd, I'd want to look at. Uh, that's going to point you toward if you're using that much water and your catch can test is only showing that you're actually putting out X amount of water, if they're not reasonably close with some factor for efficiency, you definitely have a leak. Uh, you could have a pipe broken past a control valve. Uh, but again, normally with that kind of usage, you would have a wet spot showing up in the yard. Hey, Don, this is Nancy. Another yes. way you could be a, a math nerd and you could actually figure out your system, figure out how many, what type of heads you're using, whether they're spray heads, rotors, Yep. and then count the amount of them, make a guess at how much water it's emitting per minute. And you could make a rough estimate of how many gallons you use. Yes. So if you, you could do it that way. So, I mean, he could figure out, count his heads, whether they're spray heads or rotors and look online for if he is Hunter or one of those and they would give him uh, a estimate of how many gallons per minute. And if you're running seven minutes, you could come up with a number. Well, that's why it, it sounds like, I don't, it may be easier to just, we, we, let me go one more slide and we'll just put him on live and we can find out how's that. Sure. Uh, let, me, let me finish up where I am here. Uh, we talked about the, the rain freeze sensor uh, in the greater Houston area. I think all new installations, uh, municipalities are requiring that you have one. If you're anywhere north of here, they've been required for years uh, because they, they didn't want irrigation going off when it was freezing. Some of the newer technologies get you into uh, the lower right-hand corner of that, that slide is a soil moisture sensor. It's actually buried in the soil, tied back into your controller and does very much the same thing as a rain freeze sensor. Uh, if the soil is moist enough, it again breaks the circuit to where you're never completing the uh, opening of the valves for your irrigation system. And then the, uh, the last bullet on there has to do with uh, smart controllers and what they will enjoy, adjust for. And they talk about ET and that's not extraterrestrial, but evapotranspiration. That's a combination of uh, evaporation, which is the movement of water into vapor and then transpiration, which is loss of, of water by plant foliage. Uh, there are several, well, in Fort Bend County, there's only two 
weather stations that I know of that they look at, at ET, wind, temperature, uh, and precipitation. And they come up with a moisture need. Some of your smart controllers are able to uh, Wi-Fi connect into some of these ET stations and the input back to them will control your controller. Uh, one of the better things I've seen that helps for an individual are the ones that you as the, the owner can take care of from your phone, uh, turning on and off water. Uh, you, you watch the weather tonight and it's supposed to rain tomorrow. Maybe you shut it down and say, nope, I'm, I don't want it to go off tomorrow. And uh, those are becoming more prevalent. All of these things that, that have phone capability have become very popular. And like I say, we only have the two weather stations. One of them's out by the George Ranch and one of them's up in Katy. And I'm out in the Rosenberg area. And I look at their data and it, it, it doesn't work for me. So I'm not sure I'd want uh, one of those as an, an ET input to my irrigation system. But it, it, it is coming, it is improving. They're getting better every day. Last slide, almost last slide. Uh, hopefully we can, can use less water, lower bills. And as I said, it starts in your own backyard. Uh, let me go to, I, I know I'm saying questions, Let's, uh, i tell you what, Suma, if, if you can let people unmute themselves, we'll just take the questions live. I do ask the audience, if, if somebody's talking, let them finish uh, so we don't all step on each other. Yeah, sure. So people can unmute themselves and ask questions. Great. This is a good time to do that. Hi, this is Richita. I had a question. <laughs> so, you know, our lands, uh, our builder gave us a sprinkler system, but he has all these like, you know, nozzle and spray head kind of um, sprinklers, but I want to convert it to like the soaking system. Uh, is it easy to do that? Or like, you know, we need to have a totally different system. Uh, for your landscape beds, if it depends on how your system was designed if if you have zones that just do turf and zones that just do ornamentals or or beds you could convert those beds fairly easily now i don't know if if that does that make sense to you yeah so there are like few for lots which are like really high ones and then there are for the beds but then the beds one too, you know, they just give away so much. The water drains out so easily. You know, it, it's a lot of wastage. I'd rather convert the beds one into a uh, uh, drip system. Uh, in in the beds, do they have pop-up heads? Yeah, installed? they pop up okay. small, but they pop up small. And now the hedges, I mean, uh, the bushes have grown and they block each other. And, you know, it doesn't, there's not a uniform watering in the beds. Can Suma, can you tell me if that, that's showing up? Yeah, it is. Uh, th this is a Rainbird 1800 Retro. And it looks like a pop-up. You literally put this in place of a pop-up and that barb coming off to the side would connect to a drip system. Oh, okay. Uh, it, it has a pressure regulator and a filter housed inside the housing. So it, it's a real simple conversion of, of spray to drip using oh. drip tubing. Now, the, the other thing about doing this is if, if you put drip in, you only need one of these. And if you have multiple spray heads, you need to cap the others off. Oh, okay. They, they, they sell a cap that literally you would uh, this portion of, 
just screws off. They, they make a solid cap that would okay. screw on those other spray heads. Oh, okay. So uh, if, if, if Subar, anybody can just write that, uh, uh, the, the, the part that you just showed in the chat. So I just have a record. Yeah, sure. Uh, what is the part again, uh, Don? It, it, it's, retro? Called, it's called an 1800 retro. This, this is a Rainbird part and it would, would work with anybody's system though. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Is that just the top head of that or the entire thing? That, the, this, this, this whole piece would, would come in, in a bag. Uh, I, I think this one came from, from Lowe's. Lowe's sells them, Home Depot may sell them. Uh, there's an irrigation supply in Rosenberg that sells them. Uh, but you're just looking for a, a, uh, a drip conversion kit. And this, this one, uh, because of the barb fitting, fits the half inch drip tubing, which is, uh, for, for me, this is a better one if you're doing an entire bed. So you, you have to change the whole package. You cannot use that main, uh, the one that's actually in the, in the ground. You, 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 simply, you, you, you simply unscrew one of them and put this in. But you have to dig for that to get in there. You have what? You have to dig. Yes, dig you in. do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you just can't use that rectangle up there. That no, part. no, because I again I apologize. I'm I'm hoping y'all are seeing this. That's a pressure reducer that's up housed in there. And inside is a a filter inside that housing and you really drip is much more sensitive to uh, uh, dirt than a spray system so you 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 have to have a filter and that that pressure reducer drip works at a lower pressure than spray uh, where spray is is uh, 30 and 40 psi drip works at about 25 psi Other questions? Hello? Can, can you use the uh, pressure controller at the drip, which says one gallon or two gallon per hour, rather than uh, uh, reducing the pressure here that you were just showing? Um, I didn't quite uh, understand the question. Okay, instead of putting that filter and the pressure regulator in there, you could use uh, a one gallon, two gallon little deal. I don't know what they call it. It's about uh, about a penny size that you actually- Micro drippers. Right, micro dripper. And then you can reduce the pressure by that. It just allows one or two gallon, depending on your need. It, it's not the, uh, the flow rate, it's, it's the way the, the tubing is designed to work. Even the micro drippers are designed for lower pressure. If you, if you go higher pressure, uh, sometimes you get damage to the, the dripper itself. Normally you just get more water being forced through them. Okay. We have to change the whole thing. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Yeah, this is Michael. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, can we talk about the the your, usage on your, your water? Yeah. So I think I I figured it out. It's pretty close. I just put a quick spreadsheet together with um, basically how long I'm running each zone, how many heads roughly there are. I'd have to go out and count the heads, but there's probably about six to eight heads per zone. Um, they're mostly the Rainbird 1800, so they put out 1.85 GPM max. Um, so I just calculated kind of gallons per zone, and I'm coming out to like 870 gallons for that. For that, so it, it does sound about right. Okay. Um, 
I, I probably have to go back and, and tweak it because I did, I assumed it was like the 1.85, I think that's the rate for the, the rain bird um, half circle. And I'll, it, you know, obviously some of them are gonna be quarter circle, some are gonna be full circle, that sort of thing. So, but it tells most, me it's pretty close. Uh, is most of this turf? Uh, most of it, yeah. Two of the zones are landscaping. So do, uh, do, you, do, you have, do you have Bermuda or St. Augustine there? Bermuda. Yes, because Bermuda, you, you could cut back on your turf uh, probably. Uh, you may be overwatering for Bermuda. Well, it's, it's dry right now. Like it needs to be watered. Uh, I'm, mean, watering, right? I'm watering twice a week at this rate. Okay. The, the grass has been really nice and green, um, but it's um, it's starting to, like I can see that the dirt is, um, mm, not, you know, getting, good. It, it's yeah. getting dry. Okay. So, in fact, it's weird. It's kind of a powdery um, and there's like, when I run my fingers under the grass, the um, like down close to the, to the surface of the soil, it's like powdery and brown, like the brown thatch which is weird to have that because we're bagging yes. when we mow, but it's almost like the grass is just um, starting to brown up underneath and just kind of disintegrating, but it's green on top. Sounds like there may be a problem besides water then. Uh, next week, if we get the rain, hopefully it'll help us all. Uh, and uh, particularly in your case, but uh, if if it doesn't green up and we get the rain, please get a hold of our hotline and and okay. let them know you have an issue. Okay, is that the Master Gardeners hotline? Yeah, uh, two eight one three four one seven zero six eight. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you, uh, Don. This is Joe. Yes. Um, it would also be um, probably in his best interest to take a picture of the grass and take it a close up and far away and then send it to the hotline website. Yeah. Because then we can actually see what it's looking like. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful if we get good rain, uh, some of that will clear up and, and mm -hmm. it may not have an issue. But yes, I agree. Uh, okay. So. Michael, I'll go, I take note. Thanks, I'll go back on you. You bet. <laughs> Anything else? It looked like there were a bunch of questions in the chat. Uh, the chat questions were all answered. Okay, super. Yeah. Because all I right. Did. I have, before we let anyone go, I have one more slide. And I... I encourage you to take your your phone and read and download the QR code and please respond to our survey. If you've got something to add to that, Suma. Yeah, so thank you so much for the wonderful presentation, Don. I have learned quite a few things today and I hope uh, all the other people did too. This is such an important topic and we really don't spend much time on we spend more time on buying plants and planting them, but not enough, in my opinion, not enough on the irrigation efficiency. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. thanks everyone for coming. And uh, we do have, this is the fourth class and we do have another six classes coming down the road. Uh, so we have in June, uh, it's every month, it's the third Thursday. Uh, so in June, we are doing Managing Landscape Weeds. In July, Lawn Care Basics. August landscape pests and diseases, and September tree care basics, and October edible landscapes. And we'll end the year in November with preparing for winter because last few years have been very harsh for us. Uh, and uh, it's uh, better to talk about it before the winter comes. So those are the classes and everybody who registered for the class will get uh, two things. One is another reminder to do the survey, the second thing is you will get access to the YouTube video. So if you want to revisit, uh, if you missed any part of the presentation, you have the opportunity to do so. 
So thank you once again, and uh, we hope to see you in the next class.